We're following the reaction to Uber's earnings results. And Dara, we're seeing shares getting dragged down for another day, even after you released your results early, to avoid getting caught in that lift downdraft. What's your reaction to the investor reaction we're seeing today? Well, the investor reaction itself in terms of the fundamentals has been incredibly positive. Uh, we overperformed street expectations significantly in terms of gross bookings coming in at 26.4 billion up 39 percent on a constant currency basis profitability EBITDA of 168 million well above analyst estimates and then guidance you know some companies have been announcing good results and weak guidance we announced great results and very strong guidance above street expectations so the reaction to the fundamentals has been spectacular but we are being pulled down with a market downdraft uh, along with many many other players you know, we're focused on what we can control. Can we build a great service? Uh, and can we uh, ride the reopening, both in terms of gross bookings growth, profit growth, ultimately free cash flow growth? And the answer, based on our results and based on what we see going forward, is a resounding yes. Do you think investors are unfairly putting Lyft and Uber in the same boat? I mean, we saw Lyft lose almost a third of its value yesterday. Yeah, so I think the, the reaction to Lyft was significantly more negative than, than Uber. So maybe we're not in the same boat, but it definitely affected us. And, and I do think we're, we're just in completely different places. You know, what you see with Uber is the benefit of scale, the benefit of globalization, the benefit of diversification, and the benefit of discipline in these, in these markets. You know, we are by far the number one player in the U.S., have been for some period of time. So when earners look to come back to the marketplace and start earning in a flexible way, they're coming to Uber first, and that's a real advantage. When they come to Uber, they're busy all the time, not only driving people around, but also delivering or shopping, et cetera. The opportunities to earn on the platform are greater than ever. And in a reopening scenario, a lot of advantage comes to the number one player and the number two player, in this case Lyft, may be having a hard time. From a globalization standpoint, everyone knows that the reopening outside of the U.S. has happened much faster. So we have been dealing with reopening dynamics, bringing drivers back onto the platform. We made big investments last year for some period of time. We've been used to this. We built muscles to do it. And we're much more diversified so that we can, you know, lean into the West Coast, which is reopening fast, while, you know, the East Coast has lots of profitability, UK, all over the world, we have lots of profits to pull from so that we can lean into reopenings, but we're not too dependent on one place. We're just a very different global player. And then from a different so standpoint, we've had delivery be a very, very big part of our business. And as with reopening, delivery growth rates, while they're healthy, 15%, um, they're not growing quite as fast. So we're able to take couriers who used to be drivers. A bunch of our couriers used to be drivers. They're not driving people because of safety concerns. Now the COVID safety concerns are largely behind us. We can bring them back to drive or we can hire uh, or we can bring earners onto the platform both to deliver things and to drive people. We just have a very fundamental business advantage over any monoline player out there. Sir, so you're saying when drivers come back, they're going to come back to Uber first. And you did say you don't plan to significantly increase incentive investments to get those drivers back. Lyft is planning to increase those investments. And I talked to John Zimmer, the president of Lyft, about why. Take a listen to what he had to say. I'm not concerned. Uh, and in fact, the message we're saying is that we see the demand coming back and therefore we want to invest in supply. So this is part of the reason their stock went off a cliff. Are you saying you won't have to increase incentives and that this won't lead to a subsidy war? Because that's what we've seen in the past. We have already invested in incentives. Remember, Europe opened up last year. Latin America has, has already opened. So we have been through this exercise before last year. Lyft is a year behind us in, in some aspects as far as a reopening goes. So we're very, very confident in terms of demand coming back. We're very confident in terms of supply. Remember, we have a structural advantage in that we can bring on couriers, which are easier to bring on. We can upsell them into driving because the earnings opportunities now are very, very significant. Uh, and as a result of this fundamental structural advantage, we're confident not only in top line growth, but also in margins. Remember, we guided Lyft, you know, I think their numbers went from 75 million in EBITDA to 50, and they guided 10 to 20. 
During that same period, we've gone from 86 million to 168 million to 240 to 270 million. So we've been headed in opposite directions for some period of time. And I think based on what we heard from them, we're headed up, we're headed into free cash flow territory. You did report a massive loss, $5.9 billion, in part tied to your other investments, Aurora, Didi, Grab. Are you reassessing your strategy at all here? We're not reassessing our strategy. You know, those investments were part of uh, mergers and acquisitions, different activities. And I think we made the right moves, as you can see, based on the operating results that we're displaying, which are absolutely industry leading. We're going to take a careful look at those equity uh, stakes. Uh, we have plenty of liquidity. We're moving towards free cash flow profitability. So we will look to monetize those stakes and return capital one way or, to the, uh, one way or the other to our shareholders over a period of time. But we're caught in the same downdraft that everybody else is caught in right now. Let's talk about that. Inflation at 40-year highs, the Fed just raising rates, consumers under pressure. What is your view on the health of the consumer right now and the level of macroeconomic uncertainty you see on the road ahead? I think the good news for us is that right now, uh, the consumer demand for movement, for travel, for movement within uh, your city. You saw Booking.com report their results. Global travel is coming back. People are getting out of their house, and people are continuing to have demand for delivery services, whether it's food or grocery. So I think our, our results demonstrate that we are not feeling any of these macro factors. The, I feel better about our business than I ever have. Dara, good morning. It's Guy. So let me just pick up on that. How do you see the labor market? You are one of my best indicators when it comes to what is happening in the labor market. It appears to be very tight. It appears to be red hot right now, certainly in the United States. What's happening there? What's your take in the States? What's happening here in Europe right now as well? Guy, I think the labor market is absolutely tight. I think one of the factors that's playing into our benefit is that the number one reason why earners who were earning on the platform last year weren't coming back was a concern for safety. They weren't sure whether it was safe to, to you know, be in a car with, with someone else. Now with vaccinations everywhere, those safety concerns are much lower now. And with government stimulus largely over, earners are coming back to earn flexibly and the earnings opportunities, uh, drivers in the US uh, who, who have uh, earned for 20 or more hours during the week for us, for example, earned $39 per hour that they were utilized. These are huge earnings opportunities, very, very flexible as well. So because the earnings are so, uh, are so strong right now, because of the flexibility of the platform, and because we can, of our structural platform advantages of signing up earners to deliver and then upselling them to drive where the earnings opportunities are even more, we're able to weather to some extent uh, the storms that yep. some of the other folks see in terms of labor pressure. You talk about the flexibility of the platform. One way you're leveraging the flexibility of your network is you're gonna allow New York cabs onto the platform. I'm sitting here in London, I'm wondering why we're different. Dara, can I expect black cabs to be on the Uber platform as well? You know, I tweeted, I love yellow uh, in uh, a while ago. You can see I'm wearing black. Uh, black. I love black as well. <laughs> we would love to do business with uh, the, the legendary black cabbies, uh, black cabs of, of uh, London. Uh, you know, we'll see if we can make it happen. But if you step back, there are 4 million taxi cabs uh, in the world. You know, that compares to around four and a half million earners, uh, drivers who are uh, who are driving and earning on our platform as well. This is a very, very large market that we're going after. We are the best technology, transportation technology uh, provider out there. You can imagine a world where a smaller percentage of hails for taxis are going to be street hails. That's the past. E-hails is the future. And Uber is the company that is best positioned to bring more e-hails, more earnings opportunities for uh, taxi fleets and certainly taxi drivers. And it's a great benefit for riders as well who have more choice. Dara, we go coast to coast. It's Creedy in New York. I'd like to circle back to the fuel assistance, the fuel surcharges in particular. How do you decide when to stop that assistance? Is Uber looking for a specific oil price or gas price? How do you assess that timeline? 
Kriti, we're, we're looking at the gas price and, and, and we want, you know, we're on the same team uh, with drivers. We want more earners coming onto the platform. As they earn more, we earn uh, more as well. When we put the fuel surcharge in place, we wanted to essentially um, account for about 70% of the increase in fuel charges. We thought that was kind of a uh, the right team thing to do. That was what the fuel surcharge was all about. We're going to reassess it based on earnings levels and definitely based on gasoline prices. And we're gonna be standing shoulder to shoulder with our earners. Now, Dara, I know one thing investors do seem to like, and that's any crypto adjacent announcements. Last time you came on, you said after Uber absolutely will be accepting crypto payments someday. I mean, is the reaction in the stock giving you any more motivation to move that process along? Any progress on those crypto I, payments? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think right now we're we're really focused on the earner experience and making sure their experience is the best. Crypto is going to be a part of our future, um, especially as it develops more effectively into an exchange mechanism. It's obviously a very, very strong store of value. But the exchange mechanism is very expensive. It can often cost the environment, so to speak. We've got to improve that exchange mechanism. But we're very open. You know, we take cash in Latin American markets. We'll take every single credit card uh, out there that we can. Crypto is going to be a part of the future, but not a near-term part of the future. In terms of where you see the next developments, for Uber, Dara, where is it? You talked earlier on about the flexibility that exists on the platform. A driver can go from driving passengers to freight to food. How do you evolve the platform even further from there? Well, I think it, it is all about creating flexibility, both for earners to earn however they want, whether they want to drive people or they want to uh, deliver food or they want to deliver grocery. And it can change based on circumstances. A driver may want to stay in their neighborhood uh, and if they do, they can deliver food because food tends to be around a small circle or they want, may want to maximize earnings, which means I'm going to drive people airport trips, et cetera, that can be quite lucrative. At the same time, on the rider and eater side, you're going to see the power of the platform become more and more apparent. We're seeing our ability with a single identity, single payments, our having one customer relationship with you, and now increasingly with the Uber One uh, subscription program, where you get not only delivery benefits and shopping benefits, but you get rides benefits, which are becoming much more important as the world opens up. We're essentially now uh, moving that Uber rider to an Uber customer, whether it's Uber Eats or grocery or any other service. It is a fundamental advantage that we have over every single other monoline player. It creates opportunity for us to grow, but to grow very profitably in a way that the other players we believe can't. So, look, Dara, I have to ask you about the leaked Supreme Court draft opinion on Roe versus Wade, which shows that um, it's very much under threat here in the United States. Uber has already come forward to support women's reproductive rights. You've said you'll defend drivers in Texas and Oklahoma where these laws, anti-abortion laws, have made progress. If this uh, if Roe, if abortion is turned over to the states, what is Uber prepared to do? Will you defend drivers nationally? A and, and what's been your reaction to this as a company? Well, I, I think, you know, first of all, it starts as a person. L listen, my, I personally support women's reproductive rights, but uh, I'm a person and every person uh, can have their own opinion. And, and I respect that uh, opinion of every, uh, of every person. As it relates to what Uber, the company, is doing, we want to make sure that we take care of employees, uh, to make sure that we cover employees, to choose whatever they want to choose uh, in terms of uh, their decisions. And as it relates to drivers, we do want to protect the driver who happens to take someone, let's say, to an abortion clinic who just provided a ride. If that driver is sued, et cetera, we're going to stand by that driver and help them defend themselves if that ever happens. Um, but I think, you know, reproductive rights are is a deeply, deeply personal decision. Uh, we'll do right by our employees. We'll do right by drivers. But ultimately, these are decisions that should remain personal, in my opinion. Do you have any concerns about alienating riders and drivers as a result of taking that position? You know, our position is you can choose to do whatever you want to do, and we're going to support you as a human being. We're not going to judge you one way or the other. I think that's the right thing to do.